there, you might miss the beginning of it, but what we're gonna do is make song sections. This is day three of Escape the Eight Bar Loop. I'm gonna take the clips we built in our clip stacks yesterday. I'm gonna take those clips, put them into song sections, do it in the flow using capture and insert key command that we learned yesterday, or the duplicate button on push, and we're gonna turn it into a song that sounds like this. So let me get my monitor screen up and make sure I can hear you, see you, catch the comments. I didn't want to wait another five minutes. I wanted to go live and do this workshop because I love this one. So say hi when you get here and we'll start in a minute. Monitor screen refresh. If you're watching, um, give me a yes if you can hear me and the music at the same time or if the music is too loud or something like that, let me know. Ah, all right. And I gotta make sure I turn off the monitor volume so I don't hear that coming through the mic the whole day. Alex says hi, all right, cool, thanks. Good, so you're here, I'm here, we can all hear each other. And Alex, how is the music? Is it okay? Give me like an okay or music or something like that. Thanks for watching, thanks for spending time with me. I'm gonna dip into Ableton and full screen right now and um, do a quick review of how we got here and then we're gonna go into making a song. Right here it says Steve's version. You can see it's all laid out. Intro, drop, build up, drop two, the B section, after peak, and the ending. And I was just fooling around right here. Florian, Florian, hello. That's what I had gotten up to by the time I press start. It's cool, all right, thanks a lot. So, um, in the beginning, in the beginning, I had a bass line and a beat. And I wanted to turn it into a track, so I added a whole bunch of parts in the sound design phase of music, which meant adding audio tracks, adding a whole bunch of layers, like a bunch of auditioning loops, stacking them up, warping them, trimming them, cutting them, adding MIDI channels, MIDI tracks, resampling stuff. All those things you do in the world of production, I call that the sound design phase. So I had my synth, I made a group with chords and leads and melodies, I resampled the bass line, and I did it all, or I, I routed everything into three bus groups, which, for the purposes of illustration, play a couple of sounds here. It's really helpful to have bus groups because when you want to mix all those layers of sounds, you know you get creative and you add a million tracks and it's a lot of fun, but at some point it's too many to handle and you can't go and just like, if I want to like make a drum mix only of the drums, I would have to go and solo every single audio track of drums and it's cumbersome, you know, it takes a long time to do that. So I like to route everything into buses. So when I want to mix all my synth parts, I can fire them all off, play them all at the same time, and I got them right here in a stereo group. So I can check the stereo width, I can check the frequency of just that group of instruments, check the volume, I can do EQ and compression on that group as a whole to get them kind of tied together. And it helps me make my master channel sound awesome. So like, you know, if you're listening to the master channel and you feel like, oh, it would be so great if all my drums were louder just by 2 dB. It's easy to feel that feeling, but like trying to take every single track of drums and put it up the exact same amount is hard. And then if you have automation, forget it. It's gonna be like, take you forever. But when you have a bus group, you can just be like, I want this to be just a little bit louder. And then you got all your drums right there. Or if you're making a buildup and you wanna have them like swell up and then come back down, or you wanna fade them out, you can do it all right there. And how about the low end? Well, I wanna always get my kick drum and my sub bass together, that's for sure, so. When they're in the sub group like this, it's really easy to mix my low end bass line and kick drum. And then no matter what else happens in the track, if the low end's not heavy enough, I go like this, done, bam. I don't have to change the volume on my bass line and then all of a sudden the kick drum's not loud enough. Like one of the biggest mistakes I used to make was changing the kick drum and the bass line volume. It was always a pain in the butt because it would be like one would go, would go missing. You know, if you want more bass line, all of a sudden the kick drum is not loud enough. Or you want more kick drum, all of a sudden the bass line disappears. So if you put them into a bus group together and get that relationship working right, where you turn up your speakers and it feels loud, you're always gonna have a good kick drum and bass line and then you can move the whole thing up and down and you don't have to worry about it getting out of alignment. 
So I just messed up my whole mix by telling you that. <laughs> but I think it was somewhere around like this. We'll get back to that. Um, so for part of part of preparing to make a track is, you know, creating a whole bunch of sounds, interesting sound design, adding a bunch of channels, and then grouping them and labeling them. So a couple of my little tricks are, uh, my low end sounds are both purple and they're routed to the mono low bus group. What's over here? Color purple, mono, loop, mono low bus group. What's green? It says drums bus. Do I have a whole bunch of green looking drums? Yeah, I mean, they're different shades of green and yellow, but basically that tells me they're all green. And when you look at the audio too, they're all going to the drums bus, which makes it really easy for me to mix them when I want to. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask. We got plenty of time. I'll be happy to talk about what you have on your mind. I'm not gonna get too deep into mixing because I wanna do really the, uh, the song structure stuff today, but uh, let me know what you're thinking. And then for the instrument bus, light blue color, and I've got my synth leads. First, I have these three grouped into one synth group track, and then this other one over here, and they're all routed over to the synth bus so I can easily get my hands on them and play them. So let's minimize that. And last thing, we're gonna talk about this uh, later on in the week is I have a bunch of reverbs and delays set up to play with as effects for, partly for just the, the ongoing sound like drum reverb, but also for special effects. Like when I wanna build up, I might go into the delay and make it crazy loud for dramatic effect before a drop. So these are the kinds of things I do for just preparation to get ready for making a track. And now let's look at what that, um, how that works. Uh, the end result I want to get to is a song like this, where I can start at the beginning and play through the track going downwards to hear music come out. Let me just do that at super hyper speed. I'm not going to take up five minutes, but just a couple minutes. Like this. That's my intro. Just one sound. I pick a sound arbitrarily where I want the track to start and go to drop. Now there's going to be more stuff. You know, there's going to be a build up and of course the mix is going to be different. But basically every scene here, when you look at the clips, you can see a new clip comes in and something else happens. So the bass line came in right there. Next we got some little stuff over here with a build up sound. You could roughly estimate eight, mar eight bars per scene. I'll show you the mixer window so we can see what sounds are coming in. Let's accelerate here. Build up is coming in, signifying something's gonna change. And, aha, the drop section, what happens? The beats disappeared. Fast forward, back into drop two. Basically the same as drop one with new sounds. And again, new sound, a new scene comes in. And then we're gonna go to the B section. One, two, three, four. And more sounds are coming in. So basically what we're doing is we're just adding sounds every time we go to a new scene so we can play through the whole song going downwards, arrive at a climax, which will be somewhere around here. And for the symbol climax, what I'm gonna do is take this one that says peak, and play it like this. Pretty much everything you have to go on should be happening at that time in the climax section, and then go to the after peak. Now we're in this bass and drums kind of section where it's been exciting. A couple of the high frequency things dropped out, but the energy is definitely still going on with that groove. And then we play through here to, well, what happens? Ah, new sound comes in. So that's uh, the end result you want to get to is a track that's laid out in session view. So you can play through the scenes, jam with it, go through to the exciting parts where you know like, okay, my peak is going to be here. That's where I want to arrive at. It doesn't really matter how long it takes to get there. I could play the intro for a while and actually tweak some effects live and make that really interesting. I could stay and drop one for a while. If I happen to have an MC with me, I could let them roll and do some bars. Or I, if I had a, you know, a trumpet solo player or a hand drummer or any, a singer, any other kind, or a DJ scratching, or anybody, like if I was actually playing live at a show, all these different scenes, you can extend them by just letting them play as long as you want. It could be eight bars, it could be 32, it could be 64, who cares? As long as it's interesting, it sounds good. And then I, the cool thing is that I always know there is like a landing pad to land on. So when I'm in drop one, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna go to this build up. I know the beat is gonna drop out, some stuff's gonna happen, and then I'm gonna come back to drop two. So you have a plan, you have a structure, and you have a peak that you know is gonna sound cool when you get there, 
but along the way you can improvise, change the song structure so it's a little bit different every time you play it and it always stays interesting. And then, uh, you know, the B section, the after peak section. And by the way, if I get down to here, if I get down to here and the crowd is still totally with me and it was, you know, they're like, everybody's really in the groove and I don't want to stop the song yet, guess what I could do? Wait for the right moment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, bam. I can skip back upwards <laughs> and play another whole section all over again. Now when you're DJing, let me come back on camera a little bit. You know, when you're DJing, you can have like cue points, right? Like hot cue in your, in your songs. And if you know your tracks and you have them analyzed and you've got the cue points in there, you can go through and remix your DJ sets on the fly with making little loops, going back to an earlier section, keeping the chorus as one and then the main drop as another. And you can do that as a DJ. So I think you probably, a lot of you probably understand how useful it is to have your song structure as a fluid thing. Um, and this is how you can do it in Ableton with a multi-track live set. So it's always gonna be fresh, it's always fun for you. And when you are feeling the vibe and building up towards that climax, the audience is gonna come with you because that's what makes it exciting to listen to. I know you've been at DJ sets where the person's playing and they're like going for a mix and nobody knows if they're gonna drop the beat at the right time and they're putting it together and then it comes in and they drop that beat and you can see the relief where they're like, ah, oh, it worked. <laughs> that's a fun show to be at and it's fun when you're doing it that way. Or even if you're only doing it with two vinyl records and you drop the new record and start bringing it in and it's beat matched and it's locked and there's that moment when all you can do is wait and hope that when the old record comes to a crescendo and then stops like at the end of a section, you're praying that the new record is gonna drop the beat at the right time. And when it happens, it's awesome. And when it doesn't happen, people understand and hopefully you don't trade wreck. So that's what we're going for. I wanted to just give you a little bit of a momentary overview of why we're doing this and what we're trying to achieve. And now let's look at how. So let me minimize my mixer. And I made some steps of what to do. So for building a track, step one, make a few scenes for your sections. Now this could be as simple as intro, drop one, two, three, and exit, outro. Or it could be like, you know, I have a two sections of, like an A and a B section of two different bass lines. So it could be like drop one, drop two, B section. And then let's say the B section is the peak after peak and the ending. I'm gonna play these two bass lines because step two is pick the sound to start with, pick the bass lines for the first drop. Okay, here are my demo sections. So intro. Now I did copy and paste these sounds. I just went up here, I went like this. You know, you do your control C copy and I made a skeleton. So here's my intro and I know that on drop one, I want this first track 28, that bass line. It's a bass sound, it's not the sub bass. And as I uh, wait eight bars and build up, the next thing that happens is this bass line comes in. So I'm kind of structuring my track harmonically. I've decided, okay, I made a few sketch scenes. I picked the starting sound that just gives me a place to start. Now I've picked my bass lines. We're gonna drop beats, add the sub, new sound, new scene. So we've got drop one with that bass line, and then in the buildup, guess what? It's the same as drop one, it's just gonna have no percussion, no beats. So we go through that, do we have a little bit of variation, and we're gonna put up some risers or anything like that. Maybe I'll make a little note that says risers plus, so I don't forget. Then drop two. Guess what? It's gonna be the same as drop one, same bass line and stuff, but we're gonna have even more percussion layers that we haven't used yet. So every time we're going to a new section, like what I call these things, we're gonna add in new layers. So first there's the main beat. What else do I have? I got congas, okay, that's cool. Conga resample, it's like this clicky thing. I love that sound. Uh, this one called Automate Phaser is five different breakbeats. That might sound kind of thin and clicky right now, but when we stack it up with a whole bunch of other stuff, it'll make sense. Hey, Burke, hey, Dan Pratt. And so the point I'm making here is that when you have a lot of different audio tracks up top with different beats in them, that gives you options where you can play in every drop. You can introduce a new sound that we have not heard yet in the track. Even the after peak section is gonna be the secret weapons, where I'm gonna drop some, uh, some drum loops after the main peak that haven't been heard yet at all. So probably that's gonna be this conga thing because that's like a real cool hand drum kind of vibe. I don't want to start off with it because I don't want to give the impression that this is going to be like some, whatever. I, I want to save a little bit of a beat for the end of the track so it stays fresh. So that like drop three is not going to be just literally a copy of drop one. 
And what does that sound like? Um, so we're here, drop two, got the melody, got the harmony, got the chords, got the bass line. And then we go to the B section. That's the first time we hear this alternate bass line. This is the mega climax peak, cymbals crashing, high frequency melody, chords, bass, thick texture, all that stuff's going on. And we're gonna have, you can bet, we're gonna have a bunch of layers of beats in there. And then after we're done with that, the after peak is the same thing as the peak. And all I did was cut out a couple of the harmonic layers. So it's a little emptier. And that will let us focus on, wait for it, one, two, three, four. guys. So I'm thinking strategically first about how to use my harmonic stuff with a simple A, B format where I guess my bass lines are here. These are all A sections and then we get to the B sections over here. Maybe I'll make those a little bit of a different purple so we can see them. And then the ending return to the A section. Strategically we are returning to the place we started which is a compositional technique that's gonna last forever. They did it in the very beginning when the monks were singing a cappella music in the sacred chapel in the 1500s. Mozart did it, Beethoven did it, John Zorn did it. I mean, when you start off with something, people are kind of primed to hear that sound at the end. So pop quiz, what's gonna be the last sound in this track? Giving you a little clue here. If we were in the classroom, this would be so much easier because you could just, I could look at you and ask you and you would know and we'd be able to communicate on camera and there's a time lag and everything. So I don't know if you're gonna, um, I always have to wait like 30 seconds for typing answers to come in. But basically when you end with the same sound that you started with, it gives it this bracket. It's like, it's like balanced or it's um, symmetrical in a way so that it kind of gives people a clue like, ah, oh, we're back at the beginning. Now I can be like done with the track. Or in other words, you don't just surprise them and have the track stop without anybody expecting it. Cause you don't want to drop people off a cliff. You want something that's like, you know in the movies when it says the end on the screen, if you come back to your initial starting sound and play that again at the end, you can give people a really comfortable feeling like, I trust this DJ, they're not gonna drop me off a cliff, everything's gonna be cool. So the answer is the last sound is gonna be the same as the starting sound. So the this is where we're gonna have some fun. I'm gonna improvise a little bit and build these out by adding new drum sounds into each of these song sections. So before I do that, type in the word sections if you're with me so far about what I've done in the review. So we took our starting idea of all the clips up here. We've built out variations of them where we've got like a slow kick drum. What if it goes faster? And we build variations of the different beat loops and then I labeled my tracks, I made my bus groups, so I have my sounds organized, I've got my mix basically organized. Now for my structure, I made sections where I know basically, I have an idea what's gonna happen in each section. I know there's gonna be a bass line here, a bass line there, different combinations of sounds. Now we can go and layer in the percussion just by doing this one cool key command called capture and insert, which is command plus shift plus the letter I. I'm gonna use lowercase i because a big case i looks like a number one or something. Um, those are OS X commands for Mac. I think on PC it's control shift i. So yeah, that's, you know, I don't know what system you're on. Dan Pratt says sections, cool, thank you. And then on push, of course, you can just hit the duplicate button and you get a copy of everything you're doing. So now here you'll see the value of having all your clips up top. Um, this is my palette of sounds. It's just like, just like an artist has a painting palette to pick colors and paint with. This is the world of sound, the universe of sound I'm gonna use. And now I can just start building out sections. So I wanna have an intro here that arrives at the drop. What else should I add to the intro? How about a build up? I've got this little reverse build up sound. So I'm gonna launch this. And I wanna put it below here. So I do a capture and insert and I get a new scene. And I dropped that, but that didn't sound right because nothing happened. So I want to actually do a drop. And I'm just going to go for it and drop in. A kick drop loop. Now let me show you one of the mistakes of capture and insert. You can see that this scene is highlighted. If I do capture and insert right now, uh oh, it dropped in this new scene way up there. But the song I'm building is down here. So I just sort of like got myself a little bit lost. So instead of doing it that way, 
I'm going to make sure I select the place in the session view that I'm working and do capture and insert down here. That way it drops the new scene right below the previous one and I'm ready to play through them. So my opening goes like this, little chord sound. The next thing the audience hears is this build up thing. And when we get to the end of the build up, do, 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 do. We hear a kick drum and a bass line. Uh, Alex said, I'm with you, but a little lost since I usually use arrangement view. I totally understand you on that one. And it is different to work in session view. And I know I'm scrolling around a lot and changing the view of what you're looking at. But um, to, for just the basic idea, you know, clips exist in session view and each track can have a whole bunch of clips. And then every time you play a scene, you get to hear whatever clips are in that scene. So as we go down these horizontal stripes, we're gonna hear different combinations of clips and it's all gonna come out sounding like music. So I just built the intro. It's as easy as that. We have the first opening sound, a little bit of a build up. Um, oh, and I even made a mistake when I was talking because that this scene we're listening to right here is technically part of drop one. So I'm just gonna move this down below the drop one thing and delete that scene. So here's our song, intro sound. Do, 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 build up sound. And what's six minus two? It's four. Okay, so I have four bars of that. Hey, Radu's here, what's happening? So the first drop, don't be confused by that number two. The first drop, the kick drum comes in, and now we've got this bass that has to happen. So let's... And because I'm teaching this, I'm sort of like, you know, deleting the placeholder. You can think of this as a placeholder, and I'm creating a scene that has the actual sounds I want on there. So what do you hear if you're in the audience and you close your eyes? You hear the opening sound, build-up sound, du, du, du. going through and fast forward. Then the kick drum comes in. That's when the track starts for most people. Kick drum is in there, beat's in there, we got music. After that, this bass line comes in. The low one, which gives you some low end pressure. Now, here's a question for you. How do I get from this first drop to the build up? What would you do? Oh, Radu said that triplet build up sounds amazing. Thank you. Uh, question is, what would you do if you wanted to get out of drop one and into this build up? How are you gonna do that? I'm gonna take off my sweatshirt because I'm getting warm, bounce it up and down, and wait for a second for the answer. And drink a little coffee. The answer is, believe it or not, I'm gonna use this build up again at the end of drop two. Because we heard that build up once that sort of announced a change is coming. So I'm gonna drop a new scene with this happening in there. Let everybody know, hey, you know, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen, what's gonna happen. And now for the buildup itself, this it could also be called a breakdown. People use different words depending on what you're doing. To make a breakdown, oh, Dan Pratt said lose the kick. <laughs> you got it, and I just muted that clip. So we're here. I'm gonna lose the kick and that drum beat. Go down to my build up area and drop that as a new scene. And now we're going to be kind of floating in space. And now I'm going to bring in another little weird sound during this breakdown to fill up the space and make something happen. I'm gonna do another build up, but this time I'm gonna do a little bit of a different one because I have a bunch of these in my clip stacks, right? I got options. I don't have to play the same exact build up every time. Maybe I'll use this one that's called Short Loop. You know what? Yeah, that'll be better like this. So during my breakdown, the beat's dropped out, a new sound is gonna come in, which is this clicky high frequency sound. 
And I want to arrive at drop two. Sorry if this looks confusing because I had these placeholder sections in there. I'm just sort of like um, filling in the extra parts around them and deleting the placeholders. So in our buildup, the things that happened are the kick drum dropped out, breakbeat dropped out, we added a new sound with this buildup, and I added this bass sound back in because on the next drop section it's going to happen. So let's listen through here. Jacob Nagora, what's happening? Thanks for joining us. And as I'm playing this scene, I'm just waiting for this four bar section to come through. And we're gonna be here. So, this is a placeholder section. What has to happen when you land on the drop? Answer, I wanna have cymbals. So I'm gonna pick the clips that I wanna hear playing and then we're gonna make a capture and insert to put them all together in a scene. I want to hear cymbals, I want to hear the kick drum, I want to hear break beats, which ones, how about, and we're still in the A section, I want to hear that 8 minute, 8 meter, 8 measure bass line, and I want to hear some of these kicks. So I do capture and insert and make sure you select the place in the track where you want them to come down. And I like to go back and check to see if that works as a flow. So let's go back here. Andy May, when you have a moment, can you show me in input output on your synth leads group and corresponding bus group? I messed that with the bus groups the other day, but had some issue with how I set up my routing. Yeah, man, no problem. One, two, three, four. And there we go, the cymbal crash announces, hey, we're here, we're on a new section. Kick drum comes in, new beats come in, everything's in the flow. And next up is gonna come this mid-range bass sound. And I wanna add it below that section. So I can capture and insert, and I delete my placeholder. Next up, what's happening is a lead melody. And now we're like bubbling along, you know, things are coming in, it's interesting, it's uh, new sounds are happening. It's familiar because we sort of knew what to expect. Obviously you heard the beat, you want the same beat to come back in. Why is that not looped? That's weird. And the high frequency melody sound takes the energy up higher. So the next thing we're gonna do is go to this peak section. And I don't wanna stop anything. I wanna just add a switch to that bass line. And keep all those same beats. Let me drop that as a scene there. Delete my placeholder. Okay, so before I test that to see the flow, Andy is asking about input output on my synth leads group. So, um, these tracks are inside the synth group. And the audio two is going to the one called synth leads, all right, which is a grouped track where you do the command G to group and ungroup. That's using these two commands right there. So each of the ones inside this is going out to the synth leads group. That means when I get to the synth leads effects area, I can put in little filters and EQ and compression so that everything in these three channels gets the same treatment as like one instrument. So I'm really thinking with these three tracks, I'm thinking I got a person with three hands playing one keyboard. In my mind, <laughs> that's what I'm doing, which is why I want it in the same group. And then that whole thing as one instrument, like one big keyboard, is going to the instrument's bus. All right, so that's coming over to here. The instrument bus is set to no input because we're not recording a microphone or whatever. And it has monitoring set to input because I want this bus group to collect anything I send. So if I wanted this build up to go to the bus group, to the instrument group, I could change it to that and it's gonna come out that, that, that input. So let me know if that answers your question, Andy. Um, Oh, he said, yeah, very clear to me. Now, how awesome is that? The answer was right there. I had my send set to the bus, but not the individual sounds to the equivalent group. Yeah, routing is, you know, once you get the feel for what the options are, it makes sense. But what we're not doing right now is we're not sending with the actual send knobs to aux returns because I'm using those for my effects. 
So I'm not grouping tracks with the aux returns. Some people do that. That's not what I'm doing right now. And what did I just do in the session? Uh, let me get some screen space. Ooh. We went from drop two over to the B section. Let's just check that flow. Gotta turn off my headphones. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna do another build up. And I'm gonna have this one be the original long so it can, well, you'll see why. Long no loop. I do want that to be this part right here. And what I just did right now is I made sure that riser sound is gonna continue when I drop the main peak right here. One, two, three, four. And that's still continuing. I don't want it to go forever, so I'm gonna make it stop. One, two, three, right there. And now I wanna go up even higher with all those cymbal crashes and maybe a new sound that's not happening yet. How do I do that? going to be time for the secret weapons. Aha! We're kind of back to the intro again, or a breakdown or something. So now I get the fun of building it up. Every time I add a new scene, I'm going to drop a new back to the 8 bar loop and the break thing. Next time we're going to drop these two little buddies. And now it's getting this kind of techie glitch kind of a feel. Crash, what do you do? You drop a new sound. And notice I'm doing this on the fly while we're actually listening to the music. And I'm even kind of trying to talk at the same time. <laughs> How about a build up? I don't know why, but. So now that I started a build up, I better be ready to do something when we get to the end of it. I stopped this uh, resampler thing and went over to here. And I think these chords are about ready to be done. There we go. New sound, new scene. We're doing good on time. Oh, that one needs to be looped. So the secret weapon section has all these scenes where I was dropping new sounds. Let's do a little bit of a gap. Drop a new scene with uh Kick drum comes back, I'm gonna use this other loop and my congas. One, two, three, four. And I look for the scene that's playing, capture and insert. I love it, that is so much fun. This is where I have the most fun ever with Ableton. 
because I can just listen to the music, launch clips, stop clips, make different sections, and, and improvise. It's like jamming. It's literally like just fooling around playing. And when I'm actually doing this, you can't see me right now, but like instead of clicking with the mouse, I'd just be on push, pressing buttons. You get to hear it, you get to feel it, you be in the flow, you're improvising, you're jamming, all those things that make music fun. And when you do the duplicate, or when you capture and insert every scene, you get a record of what happened. So that whole time I was talking and launching clips, it was, we have, uh, we can do it again, like this. So let me know if you get what I'm doing. Type in, get it. Because <laughs> I want to make sure you understand this part of jamming with clips and making new scenes. It's the most important part of what we can do with live. So the kick drum comes in. I'll do two bars for each one. I was fooling around last night. I decided to make that drum beat go double speed instead of having a 73 BPM track. It turned into 146. And I'm like so much happier with it. <laughs> idea is that new sound, new scene. Every time you do a, a new sound or stop a sound, drop another scene. Then you have a way to do it again later and jam with it. I like this part. Those chords before went on for too long. So maybe one of these scenes I might kind of... I'm going to color it red to remember that I didn't like that scene. Or it went on too long. It was a good scene, but too much of it. We have congas coming in the future. I think we do. We'll go down to here. Dan Pratt said, last couple of projects I was hanging in the arrangement view, but this makes me want to do a new track and just jam session view. Steve wins. <laughs> Thank you. That's the best thing I heard all day. So now we're at the, um, you know, this is like the dub section. Tomorrow we're going to do some more fun stuff like, uh, Maybe take one of these sounds. And echo it out. Why is my delay so quiet, I wonder? And I made this little effects unit on my echo right here. Now you see how much fun bus groups are because I can mute all my drums and fool around this effects unit just by doing one little click on the mute button. Now I better do something. Let's make an ending. How do you like that? <laughs> and how do I make an ending? I'm just gonna stop some clips. I'm gonna go down to my return here. too abrupt. I think I'll stop these guys instead. So I do press stop once in a while. And delete that scene. And 
remember I'm secretly planning for that to be the last sound in this track. But it's perfectly fine to have the melody come in while we're approaching the ending. You want to send a signal that the track is going to end, you know, nothing better than cutting out the kick drum. Yeah, that'll be okay. So we'll be there. Next time. So it comes down to and we're gonna end with that. Then the very last thing should be like a cymbal crash. So for my last 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 scene, <laughs> I'm gonna do a little bit of an edit right here. I'm gonna open this one up. Maybe select everything and turn those off and just have the first. So the very, very last thing that's gonna happen is gonna go Come on, zip. And then in this clip, we'll just turn off the loop and mute that sound. So at the very end of the song, last scene, I made a custom clip where there's only one, it doesn't loop, it doesn't play that whole thing. It just goes like this. And that's gonna be the end of the song. So here's our second to last, like, track is getting done, DJ's mixing a new track, the new, the new record getting mixed in underneath it. This one should be like almost all the way in, the beat's in there, it's ready to go. And when the new track drops, done, two, three, four, bam. And then this one stops. So that's how I would build down from the secret weapons area <laughs> to go through making new scenes. And I built these scenes the same way I built up all the stuff that came before it, except instead of adding a new sound for every eight bars, I went and deleted a sound every eight bars. So now I can play through this and we'll hear the tracks or the sounds disappear. sound? Oh, the legato switch is on. Tricky little legato. Yeah. All right. So what do we got? It's 1240. Cool. I try to keep these workshops uh, on shorter than an hour. Let me know if you get what I'm doing right here. So I went into um, my library of clips at the top of the, the session, like the clip stacks that we made yesterday. And all I really did was fire off clips and then to save a new scene for every different combination of clips. So we started with one sound for the intro, and then I added a new sound, made another scene. Added some beats in the bass line, made another scene, and built it up like that all the way through, thinking in my mind, I'm gonna arrive at the peak when everything is on there. So for me, the climax was gonna be the B, the B section bass line, the main break beat, the kick drum, another layer of hi-hats and, and stuff, the cymbals crashing all the time, the melody, the harmony chords, the other bass line, the texture, everything that I had possibly available to put this track over the top is gonna to happen at the peak climax. And my whole technique of getting there is adding clips one at a time and then doing capture and insert or duplicate button to make a new sound. So the mantra is like new sound, new scene. I wanna put that on a shirt, new sound, new scene. And by the end of it, I've got a whole bunch of scenes in the master channel that I can just go doop, 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 all the way down, firing off that one launch button in the master scene. And every eight bars, I play a new scene, I get a new sound, something happens, and we go through the sound, the song that way to keep it interesting, so it feels good, so it reaches a climax that makes people want to listen to it, and so that it's fun for you to perform. And also, by the way, 
um, before I developed this technique, like this can really save you in a lot of situations to have your song kind of laid out in a skeleton. When I started playing with Ableton Live in, in 2007, I think, um, I would go to shows with just session show. It's really hard to do an amazing build up and give the audience a great climax if you're on stage and there's too much going on and you can't actually like be really in your creative zone. Like right now I'm pretty in my zone. I can just have a control of what I'm doing. So when you have your scenes laid out in the master channel, I actually developed this so I could be like, please just let me have a place where I can play this scene. The main drop is gonna happen. And then I can adjust the mix if I have to. Because remember, play it live, you also have to mix. So I, I worked out this way of doing a master channel layout that gives me scenes to move through for every song. And you can have a whole set of more than one song, you know, in session view. And that way I could dependably play an intro, get to the drop, have it sound good, get to the peak without trying to think mentally, oh, what was the peak in this song? What did I do? How did it make it sound like that? You don't have to remember all that stuff because you've got it laid out in your scenes. And then after the peak, when you get into that, you know, the after jam or the, you know, breakdown dub or whatever, then you can really fool around and mute stuff and play with the effects and hit your, you know, whatever, because you're kind of, you're safe. After you've delivered the climax, everybody's in the groove, you can just like play. So this will uh, really make it a lot easier for you to deliver great tracks that feel right without having to just be doing karaoke. Because honestly, if you produce your own tracks and you get up there, you go play, and then you're like, all right, I guess I'll wait six minutes for this track to play through and then play another one after that. Playing your own tracks as a producer is not the same thing as DJing always. Um, it's like you know the song is better and you want the audience to hear every detail and you want to play them from start to finish because that's what you have to say. Like when I, when I was DJing with other people's music, I rarely played the whole entire track because people don't need to hear it. They don't need to hear, they don't need to hear the first minute, that's for mixing. They don't need to hear after the main drop a lot of the times because they would like, they probably knew the song and they don't need to hear the whole entire thing. So I would use like sections of songs and put them together like a tapestry and make it sound interesting that way. But when it's your own tracks, it's different. And it's, it's fun to be able to play live and improvise a little bit, be sure it's gonna sound as good as the album version and not be locked into like DJ karaoke as a performing producer. So those are just some thoughts on why I do it in Session View and what it's all about. Um, let me go back in and give you a little preview of what's gonna happen in the next step. So we've got tomorrow and Friday to finish with Escape the 8-Bar Loop. Uh, make sure there's nothing in there. And the real power of using Session View, you probably already know this, but in case you don't know, if you are making an album and you wanna have the perfect mix with detailed automation and everything working just right, I still recommend you build your tracks in Session View and then you do this little legendary maneuver. Global record. And you just launch your scenes the same exact way you do it when you're performing, you're doing like a studio performance. Let's flip through the after peak gap. And again, I'm gonna rush through this because I'm not gonna take you know seven minutes to make you listen to it. I'm still gonna go for it on this very last sound because I want this to work. Like that. And what was the point of pressing that red circle at the top? Well, I just recorded into the arrangement my whole performance. So I can go back to where I started, press play over here, and everything I did comes out in the timeline. That feels a little bit loud. So who was telling me about not using Session View? Was that Alex a minute ago? Alex Kolomates. Yeah, so if you usually work in Arrangement View, all I'm really doing with the scenes is making it like every you know, four bars, you can clearly see that was a different scene. So every time this stuff changed and there's a bunch of different clips in a different pattern, that was a different scene in the master channel. I think I even had one there and then one there. So I'm not really doing anything different from building tracks in the arrangement view. I just start here first in session view. So every one of these sections that's gonna be eight bars of time is gonna end up being eight bars of time in the timeline. I hope that makes sense. It's, it, they, they work together really well 
uh, session view and arrangement view work together really super well. And they're a lot of fun because now that you're in the arrangement view, I've got a song form that feels fluid, it feels improvised, and it feels natural, and it's fun. I had fun playing it, and I really believe people can hear that. If you're having fun with the beat, that comes through in the music, and people can hear that. Then I can hit my automation and be like, oh, you know, I really wish I had remembered to tweak that reverb knob in this hi-hat section. Bramp, there you go, it's done. Now it's in there, it's gonna be in the mix, it's gonna work great. Then I can go on to the third major phase of making music, which is gonna be the final mix where I go to each bus and I'm like, oh, you know, I wanna have another like minus four dB of <laughs> threshold, whatever you wanna do. You know, your detail mixing can come after that and you don't have to be messing around trying to mix live into a two channel recorder the way we did, oh my God. So when, we're, when, when this all started doing live electronic music, when you had literally a drum machine and a synth or a, se a sequencer and a bunch of modules, all the stuff that we're doing had to happen all at the same time and get recorded onto one stereo two-track recorder, and that was gonna be your song. So triggering your different patterns, playing with your drum machine to mute the kick drum and unmute the kick drum, tweaking your synth to have those filter sweeps, taking your melody sound and doing the, you know, like the, the effects that I got, like I was doing into the delay effects. All those things were hands-on knobs, and you had to mix your volume levels with a little mixing board or with your volume controls, and you had to watch the the VU meters on your tape deck or your recorder to make sure you weren't peeking into the red. Imagine trying to do all that stuff at once and come out with something that sounded as amazing as the classic house records. Well, that's how they did it. I mean, it really was like an amazing multi-level thing to happen all at once. And if you wanna get there, you should basically be doing this about four hours a night for the rest of your life and <laughs> you'll get there. It doesn't have to take a long time, but it is a very all-encompassing experience. And I guess the last thing I want to say is what I really love about Session View is that you're not watching a TV screen. So when the music is playing, you're not watching the cursor go across the timeline. So you can't see what's coming. You don't expect it to happen. And you're forced to only listen to it and feel it and deal with what's happening in the present moment, which really makes a difference. When I, I, I did work with Pro Tools and Logic for a while making music, and my tracks, when I listened back later, they felt kind of stale. You know, because to me in the studio, I'd be watching the cursor and it's going across and the, you know, the audio is moving underneath it. And I'd be like, okay, here comes that section. I can see it. I can see it. And then it would come. And I was like, yes, that was good. That was visual, right? When I listened to it later, I'd be like, why, why is nothing happening? Or like, how come that one thing happened way too soon? And it didn't make sense because there was no visual cue. I couldn't see it on TV and the tracks weren't as good. So for me, really making music in session view is like this. Boom, 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 boom. It's not, it's not sitting down like, ah, oh, mouse click. Mm, 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 mm. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to diss anybody who works with the arrangement. It's a cool way to work and it does work for amazing music. But this is what I teach and that's how I do it. So let me show you where to get this. If you haven't checked out the uh, Mix and Texture member site, you can get Escape the 8-Bar Loop right now for Pay What You Want, aka Pay What Feels Good. How do I do screen share into there? Bam, there it is. So this is the member site and you can find links on this video. I'll put them in there in a minute. Oh, you go to Escape the 8-Bar Loop, which is, this whole member site is full of, um, different lessons in all different aspects and I'm adding new ones all the time because I like building them. This one's called Escape the 8-Bar Loop. So you click on that to get the info about it and it tells you, you know, about your system requirements and how the course works and all that kind of thing. And now because we're all freaking quarantined with coronavirus, you can pay what feels good and take this with you to download guided live packs and do these lessons hands-on to go with the lessons that we're doing in video. Original price is $250. You can actually get it for $0 or uh, oh yeah, $25, that's like 25 a month that spreads it out over a whole year. But hey, I want you to take this stuff, use it, make tracks and share them back with us in the group. So I made it available for free right now because it's much more important to be connected and share creativity and inspiration and do something positive every day. I'm also sitting at home all the time, kind of feeling like, what do I do? <laughs> so I want us to be able to spend some time and connect creatively, press pause on the news, I know you want to stay informed, but don't let yourself just absorb negativity all day long. It's like, can't have it, man. Put out some positive vibes. Spend some time on your music, even if it's only for an hour. It'll really help to keep you healthy and end you up with some pretty cool music at the end of this month. Hopefully when things go back to normal or whatever the new normal is. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I think I might have to catch them later on. And by the way, for all the people who are catching this on YouTube, I'm only answering questions in the Mix of Texture Facebook group, so I will answer your questions and everything in comments, but I'm catching them here right now first in the chat. Oh, Albert Benkert was here, cool. So Dan Pratt, Albert, Alex, Toby, everybody who is watching, thank Andy May, 
thanks for hanging out and asking questions. I'm going to wrap it up for now. Tomorrow, I'm going to take this song structure that I built and do more with the effects. Maybe we're going to record some effects into clips, do some automation, work on the transitions, work on the buildups. Of course, I'll probably fool around with this tonight and, you know, make it a little bit different. But uh, we're not done yet. There's more cool stuff coming tomorrow, and I'm going to show you some of the more some more of the effects racks I built. And if you want to grab them, I can make those available. That's what it's all about. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. We are at 55.55. 55, finished.